Welcome back. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin of the New York Times, and this is the Dealbook DC Policy Project. And um, we continue on with another great conversation. Uh, we are joined now by Ed Bastian, the CEO of Delta, uh, Delta Airlines. Uh, we are all trying to figure out what the future uh, of the world looks like in a post-pandemic universe, what business travel looks like, what consumer travel looks like. And uh, we're going to talk about that and so much more uh, with Ed. Um, if you have questions throughout this conversation, uh, you can put them in the comments and we will try to get to them. Uh, and um, I appreciate you uh, asking those questions in advance. Uh, Ed, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's great to be with the Andrew as always. Um, it, you know, uh, we've had lots of conversations uh, during this pandemic, before this pandemic, uh, about uh, where we are and, uh, and and what the future of travel looks like. You know, just a year ago, we were having conversations about climate change and the efforts that you're you're bringing to that. And I, I want to talk about all of that. But before we before we go big picture on, on the future, I, I do want to just talk for a moment, if you could give us your perspective uh, on the news and these these viral images we saw over the weekend with this United plane uh, and this it was the Boeing triple seven. It was a Pratt and Whit Pratt and Whitney engine. Uh, but what your thoughts were when you saw that? Well, when you see the the video, it's it's frightening. I, I've been on a flight with an engine shut down, not one that that exploded in flight, and even in a contained engine failure, it's loud, it's it's nerve wracking, and uh, there's a lot of concern for safety. So thank God everyone was okay. Uh, the, uh, the 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 images were were uh, were breathtaking, though. Um, does, do, do you have any concern? I mean, we, we, you and I have talked a lot about uh, Boeing planes, about the, the types of, uh, of, of, of maintenance programs that airlines uh, have. Is, does this bring up any more concerns for you about things that need to happen from a policy perspective? Well, of course, we'll learn. Every incident that occurs, we learn something. Uh, I think this is much less to do about Boeing than the engine manufacturer, which was Pratt Whitney. Uh, Delta does not fly the uh, 777s, which was the aircraft we retired our last 777 last year, and we had the GE 90 engines on that, so we're not uh, familiar with that engine itself. But yes, uh, you learn no matter what. Right. We have plenty of Pratt Whitney er engines around here. We learn something from this uh, this uncontained failure. Is there anything to be said though about um, how long a plane should be the, be in the air? I know the, the maintenance is remarkable, but I, I only ask yeah. because. These 777s have, have, have been in the air uh, for quite some time, since 1995. Yeah, again, I don't think it was a 777 as much as the engine itself, Andrew. Uh, there's incredible, rigorous, detailed uh, performance reviews and checks and maintenance intervals that the engines, as well as the entire aircraft, need to go through that are maintained or inspected by the FAA. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't have any concern. You know, obviously, there's something in the blades, that uh, technology that we need to find out about. Okay, let's go big picture. Let, let's talk about the future of aviation and maybe the future of work in the world, uh, which is how do you see, if we we're having this conversation a year from now, what do you think the world is like? And how much are we traveling and what are we doing? What does that feel like? Well, right now we're off the, the, the pent up need and urge and desire to travel is like never before. Uh, one of the things I tell our team to keep them encouraged, because this last year has been really difficult, as you can appreciate, is that our product is missed. Our service has shown the real value that people, people appreciate. And I think people will appreciate those services more on the other side once it's safe to start to travel again. So that's the encouraging aspect to look towards. I think the US is where you're gonna see, you know, for the rest of this year, that's gonna be our focus. Then the industry, I don't see international coming back in any meaningful form for probably another 12 months. Uh, maybe spring of 22 would be the real start. I mean, we'll try this summer and this fall, to, but you know, with the, the lack of, of uh, testing and uh, and vaccine distribution internationally, it's still going to be very much a patchwork quilt trying to figure out where you can get to. And I think a lot of parts of the world, Asia particularly, are going to be very, very careful about letting anyone into their borders. I want to get into the details of vaccine and testing uh, in a moment. But more broadly, let me ask you this. Uh, I had a conversation with Bill Gates in the fall where he said he thought that business travel would be 50% cut in half 
effectively forever. That, that this whole experience of the pandemic, the idea that we can do this electronically has changed things so fundamentally. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with that at all. I have all the respect in the world for Bill, uh, but I think he's a technologist and I think he's, he's selling a technology solution, right? You know, the human spirit is meant to be together. This is going to stay with us, no question about it. The video uh, technologies, I see them as a complement to what they do. There'll be another arsenal in the toolkit in terms of how we build relationships, but you, th this is a forced adaptation. This wasn't something anyone chose. And, and even today, there's still not really a viable solution solution to this. So I think we have to be quick or it can't be quick to uh, to forecast how lasting this. So there, it'll it'll impact, no question about it. The the marginal trips, those that are less cost effective, I think it actually is going to cause people to be more connected than ever, because not only can you go see them, but you can talk to the virtual. But we've had video technology for years uh, and it never really put a dent in travel. So when, when you and your team try to estimate what, the, what percentage are those marginal business trips that you think effectively get taken over by Zoom? You know, it's hard to say. I, you know, I've been using a number of plus or minus 10 to 20%. I think the trips where you go to sell, where you build business, you build relationships, uh, are going to come back just as strong, maybe stronger than ever. It'll be the internal conferences, uh, some of the, the some of the, the, the the work you do, maybe you don't get to see your team as often around the world, you'll, you'll take more use of video technology. I think that's where you'll see the internal pressure. But at the same time, I think once people really do feel, and hopefully starting this summer, people will really feel comfortable getting back on planes. I think there's going to be a big demand for that. So I think we're not going to know for a couple of years. And is that demand in your mind coming from the consumer? Is that pent up demand to travel think, to see family I, I think it's. I think it's coming from everything, Andrew. I think it's coming from business. I think it's coming from consumer. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of leisure travel. If you're a if you're a price taker and you want to you want to get cheap fares, you know that that's a lot of who we have traveling currently. But at the same time, international. Um, you know, we're all you know in this country used to being able to jump on a plane and go see see clients and, and customers anywhere in the world. You can't do that now. Uh, but you probably will, you know, once, once you're ready, next year you'll be able to do that too. By the way, during this pandemic, how often have you been on a plane? I've been on a plane just about every week. And what's now, the now a, lot of, a lot of the travel isn't, isn't, isn't uh, uh, to, uh, to all the places I used to go to. It's to come to Atlanta, you know, some in D.C., some out to the West Coast. Some I've got a home in uh, uh, South Florida. Some to go there. So it's been it's been managed travel, but I, I've watched it. It's been it's been fascinating. Okay, so but let's talk then about the experience. What you think the experience of travel is going to be? Um, Dr. Fauci recently uh, made a comment just over this weekend that he thought people are going to be masked, irrespective of the vaccine, through 2022. What are you planning on? That's possible. I, I, I don't know. I think that the government will eventually need to start to ease up on the compliance uh, standards. You know, mass compliance is tough. Uh, and certainly at some point, it, it, it is a detractor from travel at scale. Uh, but once the virus is in a contained mode, once people, I think, feel safe, I think a lot of people will still choose to wear masks. Uh, you know, it's, it's commonplace in Asian society, as, as you know, and I think this is something that's going to change this. By the way, it's not just in uh, on air travel. It could be in movie theaters. It could be a sporting event. It could be, I think the public shame of wearing a mask won't be what it may have been a couple of years ago. Um, you have been a critic, I think, of uh, requiring testing before getting on a flight. Explain your, your thesis. Domestically. Internationally, I've been a big advocate to use testing to reopen international borders and then hopefully eliminate quarantine requirements because those are the things that really are putting a damper on, on, uh, on opening up international travel. But domestically, it would be a, a, candidly a nightmare scenario. It would cause our industry probably to go back six, at least six months in time in terms of any demand that we've created since then because first and foremost the tests themselves don't exist you know, we test today in our country say one somewhere between a million and a half to two million tests a day we have about a million people a day traveling in the domestic system how are you going to absorb all that test capacity 
and say that's the most efficient use and the most effective use as compared to taking away from people who really need to be tested. Secondly, there's minimal, if any, documentation, particularly in the US, of COVID transmissions above on uh, US aircraft. Uh, US travel is probably one of the safest forms of transportation. Are you gonna push it all to the buses, to the, to the, to the uh, highways, uh, to the trains? I'm not sure those are safer than, uh, than air travel. In fact, I'd argue they're less safe uh, in terms of the filtration systems and the quality of care we take of our customers. So I think it's, a, um, it's an interesting idea that the CDC floated and the hospitality industry, as well as the airlines spoke with a right. loud voice that made no sense at all. But, do you, but do you see some people will say, if, it, if it's good enough for international travel, it should be good enough for, for domestic travel, right? Uh, I don't think anyone that's actually traveling domestically says that. Uh, for one. And secondly, just think about this, let's use you as an example. If you needed to say, let's say you decided to go out to the West Coast and you needed to get a test to come back home. Right. Uh, are you going to be as as willing to take that trip? Or are you going to worry? What if I took, I, I got positive on my on my trip and then I'm, I'm quarantined, I'm stuck out there for, for a few weeks. It just adds so much uncertainty and risk into the equation for something actually that today we don't see the need. Okay, well, let me, let me ask you then the second but related question. Vaccines. Would you support requirements of effectively a vaccine passport? And we can talk about international, but let's talk domestically. A vaccine passport in the United States. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be required in the U.S. I do think it'll be required internationally because I, I think the, uh, the need to uh, for each each sovereign nation to control its borders, I think that's going to be a requirement. Again, it's similar to testing. I don't know that should be an obligation, uh, but you know we'll see where the science goes. We'll see how the vaccine gets distributed. If the experts are right by this summer that we'll be in some form of herd immunity and the virus will be at a contained level, I, I heard some. Dr. Gottlieb's uh, remarks this morning are quite encouraging. Uh, and I think you'll need to, to manage and monitor the science, but to be able to, to require and force a vaccine to get onto a public form of transportation, I, I'm not sure that makes sense. Okay, I'll make it more complicated. How about your staff on the plane? Should they be required to take the vaccine? Again, if, if they travel internationally, they're probably going to be required to, my guess, by the international authorities. Domestically, I'm not sure. We're going to encourage it. We're going to push it right. hard. In fact, we just opened here in our campus uh, a, a major vaccine, in fact, the largest mass vaccination site in the state of Georgia. Uh, we're vac vaccinating uh, today a couple thousand people on our campus, public walk-ups and everything. It's, it's quite exciting. So we're doing everything we can to help get right. people vaccinated. But I don't, I don't know, Andrew, uh, where you draw the lines. Are you going to require that to go into a restaurant? Are you going to require it to go into a hotel, uh, to go to a sporting event? Where do, where do you draw the lines? Why, why pick on the airline? So I'll I'm not going to pick on the airlines, but I'll, I'll tell you what I think the issue is. And, and I, I've been surprised, actually, that the, the industry hasn't tried to embrace vaccination uh, at, at minimum for its own staff, in large part. And you, you were not on this list, but so much of the industry took a lot of government money, right? A lot of taxpayer money um, to stay afloat, to keep people employed. And so I've been surprised that the, that the industry hasn't said, you know what, uh, we want this industry to thrive. Uh, we don't want to have to go back to the taxpayers and ask them for more money. The way forward clearly is the vaccine. At minimum, our own, our own people should have the vaccine so that at least we can say to, to the public that's getting on the plane that our, that, that our staff is 100% safe and doesn't have, a, doesn't have COVID and isn't shedding, uh, for example. Yeah, I, I agree. We're going to do everything we can to encourage it. Uh, but you know, short of mandating it, I, I think, first of all, by the way, I, was, I think it's too early to even have the conversation because the supplies don't completely exist. Completely fair. Completely I, fair. I think, we, I think, I think we have to, I think the first step is to try to encourage it and see how far we get. Secondly, the majority of the people on the plane are not our staff. You know, they're, they're fellow customers. Right. And I'm not sure it's going to be an efficient uh, selling tool to customers to be uh, flying Delta. Um, Talking about a selling tool to fly Delta, though, one of the things you have done, and you have been a, a, a pioneer in this respect, which is you have maintained keeping the middle seat empty uh, at, at considerable cost. Can you explain that decision? Because other, other airlines that began that way clearly changed mid, midway. 
Yeah. Well, we've said that the goal all along was to restore confidence, just as we're talking about. And there's a lot of different aspects to that. Uh, the filtration systems, the mass compliance, the, the quality of the cleanliness on board the planes. And we want every plane to look like it just came out of the factory when customers are getting on it. And in fact, they are, as customers tell us that. Uh, but we also know that comfort adds and space adds to the experience when traveling, when you're trying to bring people back in to air travel. We still have many customers that are just starting to travel for the very first time. And there's an anxiety ar around it and people aren't quite sure what they're gonna find. So we have, we have maintained that. Uh, Delta does get, I, I believe, recognition for that in the marketplace. Uh, there is a premium that we, uh, we see in our revenues. Uh, this last year, this last quarter, we generated as much, if not more, revenues as our competitors, despite the fact we were selling 20% fewer seats in the market. And our relative, uh, while we're all losing money, the, our lo losses were sizably lower than our main competitors, even with a big part of our product not being sold. So I, I think the marketplace understands it. They're rewarding us for it, uh, but it's not something you can do forever. So that, but that's what I was also going to ask. How do you see the marketplace changing? Because clearly people are willing to pay a premium today uh, to Delta and you, because you're an outlier, um, that you're not having to compete against four other airlines that are doing the same thing in this regard. So when they go on Expedia or Kayak or one of their Priceline or one of these services, uh, or, or maybe hopefully your website directly, yep. and are trying to, to compete on price, uh, there might be a select group that, that isn't going to compete on price, but what does that look like in a, in a post-pandemic world? Well, I think eventually we'll, we'll need to sell the middle seats, but it's going to be based on demand. Demand still is quite, is quite soft. We're uh, only at somewhere between 35 to 40 percent of our normal revenue base at the present time. Uh, as we get into the, the spring and summer, we'll have a better sense for consumer demand for those seats. Right now, I don't, I don't know that I would uh, change the policy, but then over the next few months, we'll be watching that. And if consumers tell us we need, you, we need those seats because we want to fly Delta, that'll be the, the trigger. Right. Um, over about, just over a year ago now, uh, we were together uh, when you announced a very important new initiative uh, around climate change and carbon, where you announced that Delta was going to go fully carbon neutral and you committed over a billion dollars over the next decade to reduce your environmental impact. And I remember, I think, asking you and also thinking at the time, you know what, uh, an airline and Ed can do this in good times, but what happens in bad times? And here we are. Yeah, you, you did. And you asked me about the profit sharing we were distributing that same day. I remember that. Yeah. So, so tell, sort of walk us through your thinking because you have maintained that pledge even during this past year. Yeah, we have. Uh, in fact, uh, the pledge got cheaper this past year because the flying levels were dramatically lower than we thought they were going to be. But we tallied it up. It was about $25 million is the cost of the offset for 2020 flying. And we're in the process of making the investments as we speak uh, this month and, and into next month because we want to get those investments made by the end of March into uh, sustainable aviation fuels, reforestation, carbon sequestration and reduction techniques that are gonna help us. And we're gonna start to build some, some investment thesis for the forward, forward view. You can't have a sustainable business model if you're not creating a sustainable environment for your customers to feel good about what, what you sell. Well, let me ask you, and, 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 and you and a number of other big companies have been uh, very aggressive and ambitious with these plans, but they're all idiosyncratic. And it was a question I asked uh, Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, this morning uh, about uh, whether this can be done as a market-based solution, which is to say that businesses like yours make the choice to do this, or whether there need to be other either incentives, uh, carrots, sticks, and the like from a policy perspective, push people in this direction or frankly regulation. So I was going to ask you, is there a, an effective incentive structure for the cost of sustainable fuel right now? And, and what would you do to get there? Well, we need we need incentives for, for sustainable aviation fuels, because if you look in the marketplace today, the cost of a gallon of sustainable you know, fuel is probably 10x what it is okay. for jet fuel. So there's not a commercial solution in mandating a uh, usage of something that's not commercially feasible is not is I don't think it's the right the right strategy. So I think an incentive based uh, opportunity is the right idea. 
There is so much pressure though coming from our customers you know, for solutions and from our own employees in our communities for our solutions. So we talk about our stakeholders. Our stakeholders are, I wouldn't say demanding, but they're asking the, the right questions. Our big corporate customers are, are doing this. You know, many of the big, uh, you hear the consultancies, the, the accounting right. firms, the, you know, the, the financial services and technology companies that are saying, hey, airlines, you're a big part of my footprint. So I'm having to reduce my travel in order to offset my footprint unless we can find a better answer together. And that's where I go back to them and say, yes, let's collaborate. Because if Delta is doing this in our end and you're doing there, there's ways we can work together and collaborate. I think that's where the real genius and opportunities come as compared to government uh, mandates. Right. Well, let me ask you another policy oriented question. Some academics have proposed a carbon fee for passenger air travel. What do you think? Again, I, I think it's another tax. I'm not sure it's it's going to help um, reduce the, uh, the the cost of, uh, of of the emission. I the question will be what's going to happen to the to the taxes collected. Are they going to go into the same technologies that we'd be investing ourselves into? So I, I think there's a, there's a broad array of ideas and opportunities. Uh, doing nothing's not an option. I, I, um, I get that, and, and we and we need to work with our 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 uh, leaders in, in uh, DC on, on better ideas. You, you mentioned taxes. Um, it does seem that corporate taxes are gonna go up uh, perhaps to 28%. Do you think the industry, either airline industry or business more broadly is gonna, is gonna fight that? We're not in a, in a position right now to fight that. We, we, need, we need to be in a position of being able to pay tax. So I, uh, I, uh, I, it's for us, the way we look at our industry, it's actually a high class problem, yeah. Uh, fair enough. Um, I, I, before I get to some questions, and, and, and a number of great questions are coming in from the audience, I, I did want to just talk to you about uh, racial justice, because I know it's an issue uh, that, that you've been working on at Delta in particular. Um, you've had some conversations with Ken Frazier that I've seen you talk about uh, quite publicly, and, and the mandate that you now have in terms of what your board's going to look like, look like and what your management team's going to look like over the next couple of years. Can you, can you sort of talk us through your thinking about that? Sure. Well, we have a, uh, first of all, our position here in Atlanta, Georgia, the, the birthplace of the civil rights movement in our country. Uh, Delta is the largest employer in our city. We're the largest employer in the state of Georgia. I think we have a special responsibility to lean into this, this issue. And when the, the, the concerns last year came about following the, the murder of George Floyd and, and the really the exposure and the vulnerability that we all felt because we were all forced to watch and ask ourselves the hard questions about where where are we going as as a society and the the outrage that it that it fueled. We realized we all had to 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 play our part in that. I think Andrew, corporate America, as as and as you know, has has an outsized opportunity here to lend its voice for social change in the right way. Not not on every social program, but social programs that align with the values of your corporation. This is hard to let governments lead on. This is something that actually job uh, developers can actually do something about. And so joining 110 with, with Ken and, and Ginny Rometty was one of the, the, the many things we're doing here at Delta. Looking at our data, realizing here in Atlanta that we've got 20 plus percent of our employee bases is black, but only 7% of our leadership is black. What does that tell you? It tells you there's not pathways forward and we've got to close those gaps and we've got to make commitments. So we've got to be unapologetic about it. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we've got some great questions coming in uh, and I'm going to start with this one because it's basically a news you can use the next time you get on an airplane. So I'm, I'm, you, you can tell us what, what the etiquette is. Uh, they ask... Uh, is it reasonable to ask flight attendants to enforce health safety rules such as masking? If not, how can such rules be enforced if passengers refuse? Oh, we, we are absolutely requiring our flight crews to enforce mask policies, not just on our planes, but in the airports as well. And, and I know TSA has got that same obligation going through security. Uh, we've been doing it. We're the first industry really to have to enforce it. Uh, and not not because the government made us last spring, but we realized it was a necessary component to bringing confidence back to travel. Uh, so we started at Delta the first week in May, and it's been challenging. And if people uh, refuse to comply, they they don't get access to our planes. Okay, um, 
we have got another question here. This is really more of a structural, big, big, big question uh, about whether we're going to see systemic changes in business travel and cancellation change policies in aviation that will affect airline yield management and profitability, whether it's going to affect amenities over time, whether I mean, we can go really big, the hub and spoke model. Uh, do these things change, do you think, as a result of the pandemic? Are there lessons here? I think there's going to be a lot more on the other side that looks familiar. Uh, the, the massive investment we have in infrastructure, for example, we're going to use. Atlanta is going to be the biggest airport in the world post-pandemic, just as it was pre-pandemic. And we're, we're incented and want to, to be able to optimize and maximize the use of that, those resources. But there's probably about 20 to 30 percent of what we do in the future that is going to be different from where you know business travel video technologies for example will be one of those things uh, remote remote work you know when 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 companies are saying we're not going back to new york we're moving to different different parts of the country uh, that that may actually on the one hand hurt our new york based travel but when those people are out in different parts and they need to get back to their employer, they, there's going to be different types of travel and different types of opportunity. I think international is going to look a little different on the, on the way out. I think international is going to take longer for people to feel confident going, as I said earlier, particularly to Asia. Uh, and I think the Asian countries are probably going to regulate travel a little more stringently than maybe uh, the European or the Latins will. So there's a lot around this topic that's going to change. Uh, cancellation fees, we've canceled. We're not, we're not bringing them back. Uh, we're trying to eliminate the stressors and any of the roadblocks for customers to feel confident in traveling on Delta. It was a, it was a great time to, uh, to eliminate that, uh, that fee. Okay, final question. Uh, pretend we're having this conversation a decade from now. What is the air travel experience like? And what I mean by that is, you know, you have Elon Musk and Richard Branson trying to send people to, to space. There are people talking about uh, air taxis, uh, big planes, small planes. Are we, I mean, is, is it gonna be pretty much what it is today or do you think it's fundamentally gonna be different? I, I think it's gonna look a lot like it is today, only, only bigger. Uh, I think there will be over time more international. I think that's where the, the growth for this industry is. Uh, Andrew, every year since deregulation, you look back, uh, uh, travel has increased over the last 40 years and airfares consistently have come down over that same period of time. I think you're gonna see more of the same uh, going forward because people want to experience life and they wanna reclaim their life and getting back. So I think it's gonna look more, I don't think you're gonna see big new infrastructure in the US, new airports, new places to go created. I think there's gonna be more, a more international uh, set of experiences that are gonna be available for travelers. And that's where we're gonna build. It's gonna be faster. That's I, 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 they, they, they can fly faster today if, if we have air traffic control systems that were modernized, right? You know, the limiting factor is, is the air traffic control systems, not the actual technology to fly points. If supersonic, if we fix the FAA, how much quicker on average do you think a flight would be? Meaning cut it down by 10%, uh, it, 20%? I, I think it's in that range, yeah. I think it's and, in that and range. And supersonic? Supersonic's a tough one for me. I, I, I don't know if people value their time enough to pay the real cost of what that travel would look like. I still want a travel machine, so um, I, 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 I value the time. Uh, Ed Bastian, I value your time and we appreciate you being with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you so Thank very, you, Andrew. very much. Thank Great you. Great to see you. And I hope we get to do this in person next time. Absolutely, amen to that. Ed Bastian, thank you again. Uh, when we come back, uh, another conversation a great one with Steve Bomber coming up right after this, and then a whole series of conversations tomorrow, including uh, the new CEO of CBS is going to be joining us, the CEO of Robinhood, and the former chairman of the SEC on the markets and GameStop. And then we will talk to Senator Mitt Romney. We're back after this.